thank you very much for uh, your interest and your attendance. As you know, uh, following the installation of each installation, uh, we decided in the last year and a half, two years, to have a discussion. Uh, the intention of which is really a critical intellectual one, the intention of which is not to uh, put architects, young architects, unduly uh, on the spot and to make things uh, inordinately difficult. None of that. But but I think to help to help all of us to help uh, certainly the faculty need some help and even the students can use some help from time to time to understand something something about the process of imagining ideas, conceptual strategies and tactics, and how one might go from from that kind of imagination to the implementation and a construction uh, of project. Uh, the other thing I, I should say is, <coughs> is, is, as some of you know, uh, Wayne is uh, taking charge of the thesis program uh, for the undergraduate side of things at SIRE in the last, in the last, is that an applause? <laughs> if it's not, it should be. Uh, and what's, what is evolving, and I don't think it's entirely an accident, is, is an unusual juxtaposition between the thesis work in the graduate program and the thesis work in the undergraduate program, which are by no means synonyms. I think they mean different things, different points of view, different ideas. I think, I think that's working, and I, I think he's uh, doing a terrific job, although I think at the moment we're not we're not here for commendations, at least at least not yet. But it's important that we don't get too happy. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but I think I think that evolution in the, in the thesis program in the, in the school is actually an important one, and it, it, it goes back to a number of questions that we're dealing with in terms of software modeling techniques and the kinds of, of building strategies that come out of those techniques. And again, I, I would say the undergraduate program seems to be moving in a somewhat different direction, importantly so, from, from uh, the graduate program. Anyway, so uh, we spend a few minutes here talking about Jenny and, and uh, Dwayne's project. And we were talking a few minutes ago uh, before you arrived. I was going to say you all arrived, but I didn't want anybody to think I was uh, Georgia. Uh, but and they they recommended to me that I read their piece um, that they wrote <coughs> for the poster, and uh, I don't know if that was a good idea or not. But I, but but I read it, and I have to ask actually. Maybe this takes us a little bit off the subject. But on a number of occasions, we've been involved in discussions about the interrelationship of language and discourse, the lexicon of architecture, and making points where we can that, that a conventional vocabulary, which is used to describe architecture, uh, which we find in juries and architecture schools around the world, isn't necessarily helpful because it presumes a series of references and phrases which in some cases do more to obscure the, the intentions of projects than they do uh, to reveal them. But I, a simple question, which has come up a couple of times, is the title. Because as, as students and faculty, when we, when you stand up and present a work to a constituency or to an audience, or to a client for that matter, and speak about it in a certain way, and label it using certain terms, what so often happens is the discussion proceeds based on the terms that you use to initiate the discussion. So, uh, 
the architects have said that, that this uh, salubrious construction here is, is a live wire. So I guess the, the, uh, the automatic question is, in what way is it a live wire? And how does that title help all of us to understand what it means and what its intentions might be? There's not a, a really simple answer to that, but to say that when we thought about giving it a title, we wanted a couple of words that address different issues. One was a material question, which is obviously where the wire came from. Uh, and live was originally a word that came out of a discussion with uh, the engineers, but I, I think having seen the piece in place, we have a, we, we've kind of attached a different meaning to it. Uh, the live originally came from a suggestion that was made by the engineers that it be 95% of the way through design. And they said we needed a software that made the thing alive so that we could take points and pull them but have every kind of piece come with it. And clearly there's a repetition that's been established that uh, required me to be able to think about it to a, with a level of precision the model wasn't bringing. Uh, so it required software that was alive. Uh, later, and I think as, as, as we saw how it behaved, the word line became much more uh, about the idea that the piece moved and was sort of uh, unstable. unstable. Um, ultimately, we were also aware of the fact that there was a kind of rock and roll reference to the thing. Uh, if you know the example, it's cool. If not, I'm sorry. Uh, but we, we like that kind of third meaning to be an energetic uh, of interpretation. There is a general phrase, live wire, you're a live wire, which means you, you're a bundle of energy, you can't be controlled, going, 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 going. So as an instinct, is that the kind of sensibility that the name is supposed to suggest, or not? The name has a general meaning, if you look it up in a dictionary. Sure, well that's what another rock and roll reference is not so, not so different than that. I think, yes, if, if we ever make a conscious effort to say uh, what characteristics of this make it like energy or, or the flow of electricity, uh, we didn't do that, but we were aware of the idea that the interpretation might be that, and we felt that when, uh, through the movement of the piece and experientially that interpretation would be there. And we were happy about that. There are too many points here, so I want to, I want to move forward, but I do think the, the issue, which is certainly an issue for us here, of naming and labeling and describing, which is so frequently, so frequently directs and redirects the discourse of projects, is an important one. We don't need a name for this thing. We stick it up and go home. And it is what it is. And once you raise that, I think what I'm saying is you suggest meanings and possibilities. And I think the point would be that to the extent possible that one ought to be responsible for, for the associations that might come with that kind of way of becoming this. Almost no exhibits that we've had here uh, have had, in a conventional sense, a use or a function in a purposeful way, meaning a conveyance which takes you from one level to another level. And we should, and, and since that's unusual, I mean, I guess you're thinking, Flying all over the place, but it was unrestricted. We were talking about Zago's piece, which was an unusual one. And the question is, why utility, why function, why purpose defined in that way? Why make something that goes from somewhere to somewhere if it does? 
So I base the exhibit on that frame of reference. What does that give us? Uh, I think that you know, from the very beginning, so we, we said we wanted something that as much as possible um, compel a kind of physical, um, tactile engagement with these. And the function, um, the function was, was sort of an obvious step in you know, making sure that happened. You know, you asked um, before if that made our job easier. If the idea of wanting something that forced a kind of physical engagement, if that made it, made it easier for us to make something that was engaging because we made a stair. And I would say, yes, it did make it easier, our job easier on one level, but it made it more difficult on another level in the sense that things that, uh, things that function don't necessarily have to say something architecturally. And the fact that uh, they, they can simply be what they are. Objects, on the other hand, there's an assumption that they must say something because they perform no other, other task. And in a case where uh, it's performing function, I think you just you have to work that much harder in order to, for it to actually have to say something. Um, I think the, uh, the alternative, and I think what, what was done in almost every case, um, if this is utility, utility means an operational purpose or a function, would be to make something which is completely useless. It has no operational purpose. And then the meaning, whatever it was, could never be determined based on whether the utility was served, meaning, well, if you couldn't get from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom, you failed. Because there is no bottom and no top. I mean, for instance, if we took the stair and we just hung it in the space, so it went from nowhere to nowhere, would that serve your purpose? say something but it wouldn't add I think that making the thing work added a, a, a real problem to be solved and in doing that we were forced to address so many issues that we wouldn't have had to had we simply the thing so it was just one more filter that the thing was put through that in my mind was absolutely essential to developing the thing in a way that, that it made some sense uh, and was sort of relevant when you applied this uh, to a context outside of the gallery. I just I think the things that we're making um, in, in general today, we're not setting up the problem uh, well enough. We're essentially not giving ourselves enough problems to be solved to make the work relevant. I think there's also the aspect of, of how one moves through it. I, I think that we always I think one thing, and I, to try to be fair about this, I, I think this is really not a matter of one side of this discussion or the other side insisting that there's a way to do or think or reason or understand. I mean, nor is it, I mean, it's perfectly acceptable, I think, certainly to me, and I assume to you, for somebody to say it's utilitarian, that's the way I do things, and if it ain't utilitarian, it doesn't have the kinds of meanings I wanted to have, see you later. So, I, I mean, it's, it's possible to take a position and insist on that position. You, I'm not asking Jenny or Dwayne to take my position. I'm really just trying to understand it. You could, one could make an argument that if you, if you strip away issues of utility from the project, it becomes a very different kind of project. And, and I remember a long time ago, and I think you can still get this, you can get it online, Philip, uh, the ubiquitous uh, uh, Philip Johnson, uh, 
gave a talk at, at Harvard, so you should check it out. It was called The Seven Crutches of Architecture. Um, and the crutches are, are still, whether they're crutches or not, are substantive issues is what we're talking about. But, but you know, there was the crutch of the pretty plan, and the crutch of the client told me to do it, and the crutch of the highlight structure. Uh, there, there was certainly the crutch of function. Crutch meaning you rely on this to substantiate what you're doing. And if you can't rely on it, you can't substantiate it. So don't rely on it. This was the admonition of the architect speaking to the student. Don't rely on it. The subject in his view, not that he did it, but he argued it, was that the discussion of architecture is contingent only on aesthetic issues, poetic issues, sensibility issues, and you never can justify the project ultimately by attributing whatever it is to questions of utility, structure, function, budget, and so on and so on. And it interested me that, that the way uh, Dwayne and Jimmy work, it seems, and I read the piece that they asked me to read, that it's very much contingent upon, upon functional operations that, that, that set the premise for the project. And that's why I suggested, because it's at least possible to me, because when you model this in a computer and you move the 3D model, this could be any way in the space. It could be inside out, upside down, you could do a whole series of things to it. That would change a number of magic. There, there are structural answers to why you could or couldn't do that. But you but you dislocate it and in a bit it becomes somebody's dream or it becomes somebody's inventive narrative, but it's no longer a, a way of conveyance from one level to another. So the question is, it really is still a question, <coughs> still a question, which is, if you dislocated the project, if you couldn't step on at the floor, step off on the, on the, on the catwalk, would it lose its meaning? It would not ask nearly enough of what it could do. Would it lose its meaning? Uh, I'm not, yes, probably. I'm not sure exactly how. But I'm, I don't know why you would not ask yet another thing of it. But you could. But you, you could ask any number of, 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 or obligated in any number of ways. But you, but the answers to those questions, whatever they would be, wouldn't necessarily have to do with the ability to go somewhere. It might be to see something. It might be what Jenny was talking about, which has to do with an object in the space and how you understand the space without the object or with the object. But you wouldn't be able to justify it in terms of a capacity to go from one level to the other. So, we, by the way, which raises a completely different question, and we can maybe we should get to it in a minute. Since you built a stair, what's a stair? And, and uh, which in, in uh, I don't want to attribute this to to, uh, to Sire only, but anybody who thinks about these kinds of problems and say, oh, this is a stair. Everybody knows what a stair is. It's where you arrive when the building's burning or something. Uh, and uh, or it's how I go from two to three or something like that. But in fact, there's, we may, I mentioned this to, to them a little while ago, there's the stair in General Motors, which nobody needs to go on, is that hanging stair, Sarn and me. There's the Spanish stairs. There, I mean, there are well-known stairs, that, Spanish stairs, not stairs, I mean, you hang out and wait in line to get into Gucci's or something. So you can, you hang out. Uh, stairs operate as bleachers. Uh, there are a whole series of operational ways for understanding the meaning of a stair. So if they're, we're going to make a stair in a design way or in an exploratory sense, 
what do we know about the meaning of a stair now that we didn't know when we walked into the room? What have we learned about that? Those are the kind of questions we thought you might ask. <laughs> uh, you know, people asked us uh, early on what we were going to do, and uh, we were really reluctant to tell them we're making a stare. And at some point, we had to start saying that we're making a stare. And then uh, people started seeing the thing we were making, and they said, that doesn't look like any stare I've ever seen. So then we had to explain exactly what we were doing. You know, from a functional standpoint, a stair application from one point to another, I think the challenge here was to make a stair that said something that that as a definition didn't say. And the idea was really to, to take in individual components of a, of a fundamental uh, architectural element and expand what it can do. What did we learn here? Um, what we, what we hope to say with the stair is, is things along the line of, uh, when is the last time someone said, hey, that guardrail, um, I really like the way it articulated light as it held the perforation moving up toward um, the windows. Um, or you could say the same thing with the riser or the tread. People would say, uh, where's the structural element? Well, it's that thing that's also the guardrail and the tread and the piece up by the window. The fact that we could uh, identify individual elements, but there was a more expanded definition of that, was interesting to us, and it said something about uh, how you could make a stair that was that didn't just meet that definition. We talked about this. Uh, I mean, I don't want to be late with that point. I think it's just enough to, to to float it out there. But I think the parallels or the comparisons between this as a stair are drawn by Jenny and Dwayne with very mediocre operational conventional stairs. And there, there could be, if we were doing this as a PowerPoint and we were talking about possibilities, there, the series I mentioned, one, the, the General Motors stair, there's, there's one that I mentioned to them, and maybe you know it and maybe you don't. It's in Oxford. It's a dormitory that, that, that was done, it must be in the middle 80s, maybe later, by Jim Sterling. And what's interesting about it, and this is also maybe useful as a discussion here, it's a stair shoved into an impossible corner because the building tips in a section like this, and in order to get a stair down it, you can't go down and back and down and back as a conventional stair would go. So you have to go down and then walk all the way around and go down again. And as you're going down, you're, you're looking over a river. You're going down into the river. And it's quite extraordinary. And it's a useful lesson in a way that you don't have to make something abstractly in a space where it both fits and doesn't fit. So if you had an odd configuration like Oxford and you had to fit a stair into it, ipso facto the stair becomes one that you never will see again because you're fitting it into a circumstance in which the stair never fit. This is different than that because in, in, in understanding it, the stair could be almost anything. There isn't anything, and as I'm drawing a parallel, you can you can have a look at it. The stair, the stair could be made in this space in any number of ways. So the choices belong to the architect, but the space doesn't obligate the architects to fit the stair into a kind of a priori configuration that would make it essentially what it is. Because to survive in a stair like that building, that dormitory, there's only one or two ways you could do it. And again, its peculiarity is a function of the space that it fits in. So there's something about this, I think, which is in, because Zago left. Zago made this frame, shoved it into the space in a way that you couldn't breathe, you couldn't go anywhere. It, it, it pushed against the floor, pushed against the ceiling, and pushed against the wall. So there's something about this with no matter 
the fact that it connects the floor and the ceiling, it still does almost everything it does as a function of what you want it to do. <laughs> okay. Um, but that, that, to me, that just made the, the problem. I think you know the, the things that we set out to solve uh, were things that we implemented, and I think things are made way much easier for us. When the problem is is well defined by a kind of weird space like that. I think the invention of the problem is is as much the design. Is the thing that pushes the design forward um, as much as the solution to the problem? Well, you invented this. the idea yeah. that the stair belongs to you. And we invented what the, the stair needed to do, which was essentially um, kind of bind those ideas of different elements together. And they had to reach clear out there to do this. It just, just for the record, I think there, there are a couple, I, I made a note of this and I mentioned it to you, there, there are a couple of interesting precedents that use stairs the way they've been used here at a bigger scale in a more city planning way. One is the Carpenter Center uh, uh, outside the yard on the campus at Harvard where the ramp goes through the building. And the ramp is, is designed to, it's a shortcut. And a shortcut just allows you to go from Prescott Prescott Street to Quincy Street or whatever it is on the way to physics or English or something. And as you go through the Carpenter Center, you have a chance to look at art. Art on the campus at Harvard. But the ramp and the walk through the, through the building is disconnected from the actual specific use of the building. There's another one in Stuttgart called the Stutz Gallery where you go from your house to the bus and you walk through a very big museum. You don't actually go in, but you walk through it on a ramp. It's an interesting process. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that idea, the idea of using the stairs as, as a way of connecting spaces which aren't typically connected. Very different way to 
criticize work actually doesn't happen here very much. It's easily discussed. You want to talk about that or do you want to talk about that? Yeah, you know, I think that we look, we look for that. And, I mean, and it's leading toward a, a discussion about what the role of, uh, what, what you didn't end there is what we typically talk about is what, yes, maybe the thing people would, would, would look at and say is valuable about the piece, um, which has more to do with the aesthetics of the piece than anything. I think that we absolutely, Recognize that you know, it's, it's uh, should be in the default part of the way we everything we made. But I think when I was talking about one more filter that you could put it through of use, that was one more way to impact uh, uh, a social idea. So I mean, ultimately, the issue is probably if if you wanted to do this, we should have said to you, okay, go make something, and put it anywhere you want in the school. We couldn't say put it out in the street so people people would come from the cafe up out of the cafe and the school but because the the success or failure of that to some extent is a function of what it's connected. You know, I mean the, the ramp the carpenter center connects areas of the campus that, that, that make sense that cut through and I mean you connect it kind of nowhere to nowhere in a way. So I mean who the hell wants to get up on that? Say you're out there having a cigarette. You hear Chris Gannick wants you up there. Are you going to go the other way? <laughs> Depends where he wants. But yeah, but I mean, there probably aren't too many people. What I'm, what I'm saying is the idea of making connections between, I mean, if, if we turn this around and said, okay, now we made it, let's locate it in the school in a way that transforms the, the circulation patterns of the school. So maybe this is really more of an inspiration. It doesn't really do what you said because the operation there's not much reason anybody wants to get out there. You be, be surprised. Be surprised how many people have. Yeah. I think that we had to insert it in a place. If, if a stair were really needed there, it would probably be there already. So we were looking for a spot that was somewhere okay. in this zone uh, between. Uh, it, it would be used at the time, and, and this could be useless. And I, I would, I would say. I, both of us have been surprised by how many people have said that they use it on a daily basis as an alternative to the ones that are in the degrees. Partially because they want to walk through the, the space and partially because um, the kind of traffic flow is better to justify this. Let me uh, turn to a, a, a slightly different subject which uh, might be uh, more comfortable for, uh, for you guys, which has to do with, with what you're making and the way you're making it and the relationship between what you see and what you understand to the extent that you're building in a certain way and having built in a certain way, you're saying something to your audience about building and understanding what building means and why. Can you talk a little bit about the technical side of this as it moved from, a, let's say, a software idea to a fabrication idea to an engineering idea to a construction idea and how those are related as a process of thinking about the relationship between imagining something and constructing. I think we both, I think that in our office we work closely with people in our office and that we work in where there is medium and tools. And I think that we started with this process of both looking digitally and with hand sketching. I think we both we kind of sketch something and we also have an idea about how to uh, relate to the light. Start 
first using the physical model and also using tools like uh, Rhino and Maya. And we also found limitations in those kind of tools because, you know, it, it, the thing, like I said before, it has to be alive in a way that we pull something, the rest has to work together. So while we're working, and also at the same time, we're working closely with uh, the engineers on, you know, how to basically strip us, structurally support this thing, such as thin pipes. And they have suggested to us, which is a, a tool that we've never used before, which is Contio, and which is a American common software. And so then we move then sort of back to physical and then into Contio, which allows us to set certain parameters. For instance, um, you know, setting a, if there were uh, angles that were similar, having them adjust them to be actually the same. And or uh, if we wanted to, this to exponentially actually move out further, you know, it, it allowed us to But even after that, we had to kind of, you know, TIA, these are just really thin lines in space, and it, it was also hard for us to kind of imagine that what we get out of that. So then we went back to the physical and kind of built a few more models there. Yeah. One of the things that's really important for us, particularly doing something that's in a school, of the learning students was that we're we and this is why we chose to, to show the, the work outside uh, the exhibition and stuff um, is that many of the decisions that were being made had to do with with a, a really intimate knowledge of exactly um, the, the requirements of the material for example uh, the tightness the tight radius that we could get um, within this one inch pipe we, having experimented with it before, knew that we, knew that we could get uh, a six inch radius or a six, six inch diameter, for example, but we knew that we could push that a little bit. Um, so we made a custom die, for example, to be able to bend to a tighter radius. Um, we knew that um, bending the pieces of perforation were relatively easy, assuming you have a 12 foot break. So we had to make a 12 foot break. Uh, but these were all decisions that had to be made really early on so that we could start to uh, uh, know, it's, figure out exactly how long these the sheets could be bought in, um, what the length of a, a break could realistically be made with a um, relatively simple technology, scrap pieces of steel. And stuff. I mean, one of the reasons this discussion is, is interesting and it's, it's been useful here and I think useful to students is because there have been a number of projects that, that have been discussed, certainly during the last thesis, which, which look to be very sophisticated representations and spatial ideas, but where it was not at all clear how those rep representations would be built or constructed or fabricated. So that what we were looking at are, and, and, and in, in many cases, no materiality was associated with, with the design idea. And I think one of, one of the useful questions here is how that jump from a sketch to a model to the, to the selection of a material moves the design process forward. And I think this is, this is something which is probably difficult to, to it's a little bit difficult to talk about it, a little, bit, a little bit difficult to be specific about in terms of how it happens, so that an idea exists abstractly, like the ideas that I'm talking about that were shown in the calligraphy project, for instance, in the thesis. And as you start to implement it, it's not that anymore, actually. It becomes something different. And the question is, how different? In other words, what concessions do you make to a technical understanding of a building idea? And in making those kinds of concessions, does the idea go away? In other words, what does it take to sustain an idea and build it, as opposed to move it to something which is recognizably buildable? So somehow, when, when if we said, okay, let's build this, which, which not so long ago nobody would say, now maybe a lot of people would say, so let's build this. And nobody knows specifically how to build that. And 
you start to take this apart and you see what kind of lattice, what kind of structure, but you can't make this curve. So this, for instance, so this curve now becomes a sequence of straight pieces and on and on. And if you can't control it, in, in so many cases, what you wind up with finally is something which is likely to be quite different from what was imagined, maybe. So the capacity both on one end to imagine something as an idea and to understand what it takes to implement the idea and to understand that it won't be the same and it will be the same. And that tension between those possibilities, I think, is, is, is critical. And you can see it out in the hallway, actually. You can see where it started. This is not an argument for knowing what you know how to build and drawing and designing what you already did. Because since you already did it, the investigatory part is not so much. Because you did it before. And if the client is standing there, the client actually likes that very much. Because the client knows you did it already, meaning you know how to do it, as opposed to the client sitting there and writing, writing checks for somebody to sit in a process and wondering about how to implement an idea. And that kind of tension, actually, is the essential tension, I think, which always takes place in these circumstances. When someone is trying to push an idea, and to, and to implement something which isn't yet understood. And you're asking somebody to support an effort for you to investigate with the aspiration that what will come out of it will be something they don't quite recognize yet. You understand what I mean? Maybe, maybe they didn't explain it so well. But I think that, that there's, there's something in this process which has to do with moving a discussion forward and knowing enough about it to know where you want it to go without being a master of it, in which case we're not interested anymore because we already know how to do that. And to some extent, I think we're looking at that here. Somebody trying to make something they don't know how to make and how to do that, as opposed to somebody knowing something they absolutely know how to make. And again, in, in, in the context of, of, of this discussion in Sire, we're not interested in that. Can you talk about that a little bit, or did I kill you? <laughs> I will say that um, um, there, there are elements of this that we we do have. Yeah, uh, obviously, we've worked with this material before, and you know how much how much longer we'll continue to work with it. I don't know. I mean, at this point, I think with every project, we've said how can we push it in a different way, and how can we we, we learn something from the project each time. In this case, uh, there was a fair amount that we learned in doing it, so we can. I wanted to comment on the earlier issue of um, knowing what you're doing going in. Uh, we, we've been asked quite a bit if we um, if we know when we're making something, when we're designing something from the very beginning, uh, what the material will be and how we might make it. Um, and the expectation is usually that we do, and that allows us to consider the design um, um, from the very beginning. I think that's not really the case. Um, we know we make a determination. On relatively early on um, about what we think it might be. But normally we find that, that working with an assumption that it'll be a certain way uh, restrains us. So uh, for at least a, a certain percentage of the project, we explore completely uh, free of whatever preconceptions might be associated with a certain material. I mean, I think, I think in very broad terms, the history of, of architecture in careers over time has to do with, with, even in the case of unusual architects, who investigate and who discover and who learn and who master and inevitably the investigatory component diminishes and the redundancy component increases. And I think this is, this is an argument in a way for continuing to open up the discussion 
as opposed to repeating the discussion. I'm not saying it's easy to do that. I think it's not easy to do that. But I think this is a goal, or this is an aspiration, or it could be. I think there's a, 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 a I remember a, it, it was a debate, it was probably eight, ten years ago at some AIA conference with uh, uh, Robert Stern, who runs uh, Yale at the moment. And I said something like that, and he said, no, it shouldn't be that. Architecture should be a matter of mastering certain subjects and repeating what you know for various reasons. But the only reason I say that is, is in, in the interest of equity or equal time. What, what we're arguing for here is a way of thinking. It's not the only way of thinking. Now, nobody is saying you have to be a, you have to be a believer in, in, in the project. I think what you have to I mean, this is, this is, you know, I, I think what you have to learn how to master is to master what you haven't mastered, and and uh, and I think what that means is that you have to try to learn how to deal with subjects that you don't quite recognize and bring to bear what you know or what you've learned in order to not so much solve things finally, but to kick the can down the road or to move the discussion of problem solving forward. So I think in, in a way that, that you have to learn, I mean the best thing you can learn is to be comfortable being less than comfortable with ideas. So there, there, are, there are cases, you know it's funny, I, I, I hate to mention it's not a very esoteric reference. Sitting on another uh, long plane ride the other day, watching uh, the Joker uh, talk to uh, falling asleep and waking up, and, and, and the Joker talking to uh, the guy who lost half his face. Uh, and you should go back and, and, and look at that discussion. It's actually, yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I know. It's not biblical and Kafka didn't say Foucault or whoever you like. But the Joker, and, and there's some line in there about, you know, I'm like a dog who chases trucks or buses. I have no idea what I would do if I ever caught the bus. I don't know. I'm opposed to all you guys with the police or the criminals who plan everything and scheme everything. It doesn't work that way. I'm the guy who throws the wrench in the gears. And this is the joker talking. It's actually a pretty good speech, I have to say. And, and uh, uh, it, it has something to do with this, with this discussion about the limits of control. And that, that I think what interested me about this project, I can't figure out how to get them to talk about it, is, is that it's very controlled, but there are aspects of it that, that, that are less than controlled, and there's, there's, there's an important mixture of the two. I mean, for instance, I can sit here where I'm looking from a certain vantage point, and it looks like could be a field of bamboo. I have no idea what piece is going where and why. I just don't know. And I could never read it. I could never decipher it. It's illegible. But I can look up, I lift up my head and I see parallel, 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 parallel. And then I look up on the wall and I see module, 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 module. And then I look at the, at the treads, and I see every pair of treads linked with a support system over and over and over and over and over and over. And, and at least as an experience, what's, what's I think important about it is that it seems to be a very unusual admixture of pattern. 
patterns and systems and methods and redundancies from certain vantage point. And from another vantage point, it's just the joke. You know? And it's hard to put those two things together. And to me, this was part of the, the, the really the, the success of the project. We know you No, we 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 knew that. I mean, uh, well, the, the the project that we did uh, a year ago, Joe's publications. Uh, the success of that to me, cantilever all the technical issues aside, was uh, the ability of the piece to really create this this incredible environment and a sense of wonder about how it works structurally. You know, you could look at the piece, and you knew that many of the pieces were working hard. You knew that many of them were not. Um, but you couldn't, you couldn't identify which were and which were not. Um, and in this case, I think you've got a similar, a similar issue. Some of them you know are working in a certain way. Some of them you know are in compliance with the overall geometry. And some of them, I mean, it seemed not to be. And its ability to kind of um, raise that sense of wonder about how it works, and whether or not it's actually part of the system, was, was part of a kind of engagement that was beyond uh, using a handrail to support yourself. I, I think there's, yeah, there is no handrail, by the way. It's extremely <laughs> dangerous and, and won't get through and, and won't get through the building department. I, one, one thing which is, I think, at a different level, very important to all of us, which which belongs to these uh, jokers, and maybe we can call them jokers, um, which is the love of making things. And there's a kind of, aside from all of the rhetoric and all of the intellectualization, just the love of the piece. And and you you feel that looking at it, you know? The, the, the kind of energy and the conviction and the commitment and the interest in doing that. And I think that moves a lot of ideas a long way. There's a love of making stuff, you know? And, and I think for, for all of us, I think that emotion is, is critical to, to an appreciation of what they did. I don't know if would you like to deny that or something. No, no, no. Thank you for recognizing that. I would say that. You see screws and welds. But do you know where the screws are in this project? ones that are on the, the wall. Yeah. I actually haven't looked at it anywhere except for where I said. Okay. It wasn't a trick question. I can't remember. No, I'm glad you didn't see it. The reason I mentioned it is that, that, that what actually keeps it from falling down, you can't see. So, I mean, you can see. You have to look in the floor next to, you know, where you see it. You can see the screws into the concrete and so on. So, in a way, for, for all the interest of a kind of technical prowess, exuberance and all of that, there are very critical pieces which are almost undiscoverable into the wall, into the floor and so on, and the wells too. And, and the question is, so when, when you talk about understanding and the visibility of the elements of the project, that also has a very interesting invisibility component. Meaning, the reason it's not sliding out into getting there is one reason. There's screws, you know? And you don't see the screws. So, again, for all its interest in visibility, it's a mystery, you know? There's a mystery. I think that's a big kind of view of the kind of the modernist paradigm of being able to, for architecture to be measurable in a way that's accountable to the other discussion, but somehow being created. It's legible as what you describe, which is the program, it's a stair. There's all sorts of things that are built in, the screws and the wells, but also the upload of fitness and the threat. We had that discussion with the other way to do what you said about it. So, in the, in the kind of functionalist sort of paradigm, that's marked in the legibility of things by the looking at it. And it's really interesting to me where you choose to find.
form of new or kind of legibility of your interests in your subject. And where you choose to solve the problem differently. You've got problems. Because it's absolutely you it moves. It's never the same. The problem isn't always that here's a rule. It's one of the most changes you have. And I think it's an important thing for people to understand the work. It's also important for people to read the pieces. I'm not expecting that the book or the work that the piece should be written or why we should be used in the same thing for the way. And I think we don't talk about it. We care to try to kind of get into it. It was concealed. It was frankly more interesting to me than their best so visible. Because they, they carry with them a kind of resistance. The only way to I can respond to that is, is to say that I, I don't think that we go into a project with a kind of blanket set of rules about what should be exposed or not exposed. We tend to take them piece by piece. And so for me to talk about why we chose to do things would require that I that I say specifically why we chose to like this or that. And so I'll do a couple very quickly. Uh, you know, with these these loops, some of them involve uh, a longer loop is, I don't know, roughly 80, 100 feet of tube, and uh, for every bend there's a joint, and we had to grind those and, and clean them. Um, so in some cases you have 20 joints on the ground and clean an incredible amount of energy and try to eliminate that. But then we go and we expose the well. Seems a little funny, um, but the ultimately it, it, the, the idea to us was was really dependent on reading these loops as, as long continuous elements that made the individual thing that one bend and joint accomplished uh, indistinguishable. So we ground those, hence the the, the long reading. The wells. Uh, uh, one, I'm not sure we had a, a slick way to eliminate them, but they also didn't act in that same kind of perpendicular way. Uh, they weren't per perpendicular to the movement of that um, of that tube. So to leave them for me was, was fine because... But it also allows us to understand the loops as individual loops rather than looking at them as a ground well that it all becomes... We had this whole discussion with, with Eric looking at the project last year about whether we ground the wells or exposed the wells. And most of those were, were ground at that time. And I, I think one simple answer to a very, very simple answer why we left the wells at this point is uh, we've become kind of more uh, experts at it. We had, we had mastered it well enough that it was worth being exposed. I mean, I'm not sure whether that's a bad answer I don't think it's a question. I mean, there are, there are ways of looking at construction, steel construction, in a technical way. And, and either in the end or the beginning, you have to say what it is that you want. I mean, do you want a Swiss watch that never came out of the drawer? Do you want a Swiss watch that's been sitting in the snow for 10 years? In other words, there are different ways of putting materials together, and there are there are very conventional cost implications of those things. But those aren't really the issues here. How do you, they, they, this is made of pieces attached to each other, and the building. How do you make those attachments? How do you understand those attachments? I mean, that screw, that screw could have been a pin. The pin could have gone through a big hole. You could have made a hell of a big issue out of every pin in the building. You know, this is a screw versus this is a screw. Big issue. It's an exaggeration operationally, but in a conceptual way, it would have made a very different kind of point in a more, in a way, didactic point, meaning in case you don't get it, these pins are very critical. Therefore, we make the pins, we make them enormous. So issues of signs, actually, are not only, I mean, if somebody, if you look at one of those beams up there, and it's a building that was made, I don't know, 110 years ago, and my guess probably is, aside from not very much understanding of reinforced concrete, what
what you're looking at up there is pretty much what some engineer thought was some safety factor it would take to span this distance. The big, the deep one being the short, the, 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 the 60 foot dimension of the building. But there are any number of other ways that could have been made, shape wise, depth wise, color wise, finish wise. And although this was a freight depot and nobody was, was, was particularly interested in a didactic aspect of structure, this is in a way both, both a method for going from one floor to another. It's a method of teaching and it's a method of learning. And what we're learning about is how to build and how big is what and why. And the point would be, how do you decide? And somewhere in this discussion, there are purposes all the pieces don't have to be the same size. Why are the, if, if you pull out those perforated folded pieces, what happens? Where do you fill in between, between pipes? Where do you not fill in between pipes? Those kinds of things. And it would be interesting to have... Well, I don't want to interrupt, but I mean, no, there's so many things to talk about. Um, I'm predisposed to like it, but the more we talk about it, what, what's interesting to me is that it's really not a snare, it's a snare about a snare. And that makes it completely different uh, when you start thinking about usability versus, uh, let's say, sculpture. As Eric was saying, the, the previous installations have no sort of official use. And the discussion tonight is about adding use and adding parameters and, you know, thus making a difference. For me, I understood it as an optical spatial project. And you know, looking at it as a kind of parametric phasing idea of um, a stair ascending the stair, if you want to bring up the shot. Um, it's about that kind of idea of um, phasing movement through space but letting the stair be the figure, so to speak. And so I didn't want to stand on it for a lot of reasons. Uh, and I was encouraged to do it, but the reading of it as an optical thing in the gallery is extremely robust to me. And walking on it, moving on it, is completely, it completely annihilates the spatial uh, sort of poetry of it for me. So it's two really different projects when you're on it and using it. The notion of moving up to the oblique, and all that, I really understand that. But I think that it favors the origin of how it was conceived and doesn't, doesn't favor its destination about how it's becoming happen. That's why you don't be able to show off the strings going to the wall. And I think it's a really interesting project because it's, in an easy sense, reluctant about becoming something other than how it was conceived of. And that, that's not a... That's not a nothing bad about that. I just think it favors one way of considering itself. It is reluctant about adding, in fact, more parameters to it, like gravity, torsion, and deflection. Uh, so the live part is different than the wire part to me. It's a live dash wire, not a live wire. I guess one of the reasons I said you could make a stinger, and this is, makes it more of a dream, less of a guess what problem we're solving. It goes from nowhere to nowhere. Stair doesn't go anywhere. Or it starts somewhere and it goes nowhere. No destination. Stair nobody goes on. Nobody goes on. Could be. Or a stair that doesn't go anywhere. Since it doesn't go anywhere, you know, so this, this would be another way of understanding. It, 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 it would take the utility away from it. So there's some irony in that, that you would make something which is understood as a conventional conveyance, and it wouldn't convey anybody anywhere because there's nowhere to go. I think the, the stair the stair to nowhere, the stair to nowhere is sculpture. And I, and I think that that's certainly something architects have pursued over the yeah. pursuit period. I actually think what you're interested in is, I think what's difficult about tackling this project is that I think you're actually more interested in a pictorial and sculptural sense of formal exploration. And it's a subtle difference, but an important one. This idea of difficult lines in space, the notion of a kind of, a kind of possibility of, of kind of 
five and performative drawing through through accident through accident construction, I think is really wildly self evident in this project and, and brilliantly executed. I agree with Eric, I think. The new descending staircase, and I, oh. you know, we talked about Gerard Richter's role in the staircase, which even, even in chromatic terms has a really profound and beautiful affinity with what you've come, come up with here. I think both are both are really diagonal works in, 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 in pictorial formalism. They take the diagonal as a comp compositional device, they actualize it as subject matter, and then they play out a series of techniques in terms of exploring what their medium painting can do with these new possibilities in, in that kind of space. And I think actually, you know, the, the kind of the card that you play where it's no longer it's no longer the actor on the stair the stair itself that is actualizing those transformations is probably on a kind of disciplinary level the slight of hand that all of us need to make to make architecture, I think, kind of salient in in kind of broader Visual, you know, visual cultural terms. And what I want to ask you about actually is are the specifics of, the, of these kind of what, in both cases, with Duchamp and Richter, there was something they were trying to get across. Duchamp wanted to talk about the difficulties of cubism and futurism and the body of motion as some of the painters were trying to describe in different ways and problems his generation was running into in doing it. Richter has a similar fascination with the technology of photography and what that does to painting. And the way motion is and isn't captured in the film and the way that does and doesn't alter what you can paint as a result. And I guess my, my question for you is, you talked a little bit about, Tita, about what you needed to do to realize what you were interested in. But I want you to talk more about the parameters that got you there. You talked about, and actually, Eric, I'm not sure that I see much of Joker here. Because to me, it looks like a lot of it's a series of rule sets, not a rule set that's then, I think, violated through chance play. It looks to me like the modularity that you, that you described is, is radically repetitive and evident as we move up the wall, where actually the only faster is, and this is why I, I want to talk about it in pictorial terms, the only faster is I see, or what hang it on the wall and make it, I think, participate more in kind of sculpture and architecture after painting. Than some than architecture that's competing with sculpture as an object in the round. But in any case, you see the repetition there. But here, basically, there are at least two orders of variation. If you go through what it was that actually set up the geometric differentials you were interested in, and why you chose them. Well, the, the first the first frame that was added is one that ultimately uh, I think doesn't doesn't really matter. Originally, the main like elements had to do with the repetition of the windows. And we started with this idea of light moving through the windows. And that established a certain repetition. Uh, but then, knowing that it would become a stair, um, you're dealing with a number of steps that obviously uh, would need to be more than the six or seven windows that are up there. So at that point, you start to uh, associate one window with two steps. And um, knowing that the, that the skeletal quality of the piece was essential to the, the spatial reading. Um, we then matched every two steps as having a skeletal element, a, uh, an infill element, which would have to act as the treads of the guard ray. And, uh, and the coupling of those two things, essentially, with, with all of the things they needed to perform, uh, then became the, the parameters. I'm sure there are many more than the, the math that uh, were added, you know, step by step. But, uh, after all that, I'm asking from kind of a simple, I hope. It's interesting to me that the differential pulls as you move to the right side of the stair, it pulls radically down building, down, down building, where as you, what, what led to the kind of doubling of the, the diagonal of the stair, and then, a, and then a, a kind of oblique variation of the structure as it builds up through it. What set up that, that kind of differential against the diagonal? Is that the shaft? Is that related to that the, the, sh the kind of indexing the shadow play? I'm not sure we thought about it at that point specifically. I think that we were thinking about um, very carefully, kind of masking the intelligence of the system that was um, the two treads being a part of a system, one moving in one direction, one moving in the other. Uh, 
um, I think you don't recognize that instantly. Um, to recognize that the system uh, is not, I, I think you look at a stair and you expect the system to be repetitive based on each individual unit. And in this case, it's every two units. And um, the moving in different directions uh, it is kind of keeping you wondering about what the intelligence of the system was. And I think that moving them in opposite directions was just one step toward kind of masking that, that, uh, that solution. I mean, Joe, part of the, part of the problem is that, that whether the joker is in the room or not, the, the, not only the way you asked the question, but the way Jenny the way you answered it suggests that it's all about scheming. It's all about planning. It's not about the opposite that he calls chaos. It's not about the guy throwing the wrench in the gear. But if you sit where I'm sitting and you look where I'm looking, it's hard to read it in an analytical way, which the pre-eviction is in discussions of this time so much to read it and explain it and understand it in that way. And the way to get rid of that, actually, Zago is the only guy who ever did it, is to shove the thing up against everything. So even if it's the biggest schemer in the world, you never can read it because you're never in a position, meaning it's too small, actually. And if you shoved it against the walls and shoved it up against the roof and shoved it into the floor, nobody could see those pieces, hypothetically. You don't open it up, you close it down. And therefore, the experience of, of, of the piece, you can't get access to it. You can't get any distance, you can't measure it. Because it's like being, you know, not Googling the Oki Okefenokee Swamp. It's like being in the Oki Okefenokee Swamp. This is a good, yeah. Then you have no idea where the alligators are coming. And I think I think what what happens here is that you know I'm, I I get some of that even though but I think you're right in the way it was analyzed and understood and I think worked on is much more about the control of the pieces than it is about an experience which, which suggests the control's not there.
we absolutely like it best in that position where there is that reading from behind. Um, and from the front where it's read clearly as a stare uh, is where we like it the least. I think it splits the narrative. It unbinds a single narrative into two. And then you have to deal with two strands. Which are yeah. But I mean, I'm really happy that it is functional. Don't, don't get me wrong. But it's different than when, when you're looking at it and understanding it as a, a, a phenomenal idea cerebrally. It's different when you touch it haptically and you feel it move. It's, it's different. And I'm, I think that's a not, it's a predicament many people are in. Um, and leave it that. Sorry, this wasn't supposed to be a kind of interrogation of the audience.